join me in reading Psalm 133 responsively and singing the refrain as printed in your bulletin. Very good and pleasant it is. And children live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard. On the beard of It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing. This is the word of the Lord. Give your journal together. We'll go to week four. That's on page 20. And we've spent the last three weeks learning why alignment is important spiritually and how our alignment affects our hearts, especially in the area of generosity. We must be aligned with the word by staying connected to the central vine, Jesus Christ. And one of the primary ways of doing that is by abiding with Jesus in Scripture. And so a great way to do that is to get plugged into one of our Sunday morning discipleship classes. Uh, we must be aligned with the Trinity, which is one of the key things we do when we gather here each week for Sunday worship. And in doing so, we better see and reflect God's character of generosity as shown through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we must be aligned in heart because generosity is not a money issue, it's a heart issue. Generosity comes most easily when we experience contentment and thus heart alignment. And for some, including myself, this is the hardest area of the three because this is the tough day in and day out work of protecting our hearts from the bombardment of interests that strive to create unrest in our souls. And these areas of alignment are very self-focused, right? What am I doing to stay aligned with God? And hopefully you've done that tough daily work of the past few weeks. And today, we can join together with individual aligned hearts and combine them to see what it looks like when a congregation is aligned together. I want to invite you to dream just for a moment about something I dream about every now and then. We've got just over 200 active households in our congregation and, and I wonder what would it look like if all 200 plus of us were aligned in vision. God being the great multiplier, what could he do with our combined hearts that we as individuals could not do alone? For we can do nothing apart from him. What does he want to accomplish through us? And I know that for us to achieve the dreams that God has for FPCA, we have to be aligned together in vision. Now, togetherness and unity may not be the emotions that you've been feeling since the election. And if you're disappointed, that's okay. I don't know anyone who's never been on the losing side of an election. What's not okay 
and I'm speaking strictly of those from a Christian worldview, is severing relationships and disinviting family or friends from Thanksgiving based on how someone voted. Now, if someone from one side or the other is abusive or worse, that's something different. But so-called mental health experts out there encouraging the severing of relationships based solely on how someone voted is frightening and unnecessarily hurtful. Just remember who Jesus called to be part of his inner circle of disciples. There was Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew was seen to be a traitor to his fellow Jews. And then there was Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were sworn to assassinate every traitor and Roman they could. But Jesus called them to a greater identity and purpose than tax collector and zealot. And they learned to live and serve together because Jesus mattered more. He does the same for us. Yes, we can be passionate. Yes, we can vote and have political ideals and beliefs. And I would say as Christians, we all should. But as believers, as followers of Jesus, we lay those to the side and recognize that Jesus Christ alone is our Lord and Savior. And that supersedes all other loyalties and passions we may have in this world. Our God is one of reconciliation. That was the purpose of Jesus' atonement on the cross. He was without sin, but suffered the death we all deserve because of our sin so that we would be reconciled to God. And with that, we are to be reconciled with one another. And for one, I'm thankful that we are not a solidly red or blue church. I have a lot of colleagues, and we, we just often refer, we have, we have purple churches. And I admire how most of the time, we live and serve together in healthy ways that can serve as a model for others. So dream again for a moment of your upcoming Thanksgiving dinner. Picture it as Norman Rockwell as possible. Who is sitting there at the table that you would consider as the guest of honor? Maybe it's the patriarch or matriarch of the family. It might be just you and your spouse, so be sure and choose them as, as a guest of honor. And then picture the spread on the table with everything you could possibly serve. And maybe that person is invited to have the honor of saying grace. The blessing! Sorry, I'm already in Christmas movie mode. Um, Maybe they have the honor of, of saying grace. And afterwards, before anyone can carve the turkey, you excuse yourself, you run to the kitchen, and you return with this big jug of really fine olive oil. And this isn't to dip bread in. No, you, you open it up, you stand behind that guest of honor, you raise it over their head, and then you dump it all over this guest of honor. What is their response? <laughs> In my vision, they're not taking it too kindly, nor is Chelsea wondering, how am I going to clean up this mess, right? <laughs> I mean, oil is messy stuff. But in the Bible, this was a sign of incredible generosity. 
Think back to Psalm 23, right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And this custom continued in the time of Jesus as we read in Matthew 26, 6 and 7. No, now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Well, times have changed, and that's okay. This is no longer a, a custom in our context. So, what does Psalm 133 look like in the life of the 21st century church? This psalm was part of the Songs of Ascents. It was a scripture that families would sing together on their way to Jerusalem and back. And so you might notice that this psalm has a familial feel to it because as Thanksgiving can show us, even in non-election years, unity is often hardest achieved or experienced within a family. I mean, just go to just about any wedding, funeral, birthday party. There always seems to be at least two people from the gathered family who are upset with one another about something. There's one other instance from Scripture where, where this phrase where kindred lives together is used. That's from Deuteronomy 25, which also is, is addressing families. And conflict. So if you ever feel like your family in particular keeps the fun and dysfunctional, the Bible knows exactly how you're feeling and what you're talking about. So yes, unity applies to biological families, but it also applies to the gathered people of God, the church. That's the shift we see from verse 1 to verse 3, when it moves from a close, intimate setting of kindred living together in unity, and it shifts to Veyer, to Zion, connecting all of these individual families together into a family of faith. Families went to Jerusalem aligned in faith and purpose. So what we see is that unity is a byproduct of alignment. How precious it, how precious it is when a congregation lives in alignment. I'm, okay, that's not the exact words of the psalmist, but it too is a worthy dream for the church. What can we do when we are aligned in vision? Well, let's look at another example in the Old Testament to see what that can accomplish and what it looks like. Joshua chapter 6 tells the story of the fall of Jericho. Joshua was a man aligned with God. He was a tremendous leader of God's people, God's family. Aligned in their faith and obedient to what God had called them to do. They did something that had to look pretty foolish to the inhabitants behind the mighty walls of Jericho. For six straight days, they got up and they marched around the walls, blowing horns, carrying ram's horns, along with the Ark of the Covenant. Think of the trust everyone had in God to go through with that every day. At the least, they were probably mocked. At worst, they were likely spread out and vulnerable to an attack if they actually wanted to, to leave those walls and come. They were vulnerable. But on the seventh day, they got up early and they made seven laps around the walls. 
When the priests blew the horns, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. As soon as the people heard the shout of the trumpets, they raised a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Surely some of them had to have felt a little foolish along the way. But when they came together in alignment, no one could argue with the results. Scripture challenges us to do something that can appear to be a little foolish as well. And thankfully for us frozen chosen Presbyterians, it involves no shouting. Instead, we're instructed to return to God the first 10% of whatever we make. All right? It's called the tithe. Back then, that could have been money. It also could have been crops. It could have been livestock. It's whatever the proceeds of your profession was. Return to God the first 10% of that. Even as a young pastor, or when I was a young pastor, I'm no longer young, but <laughs> when I was a young guy as a pastor, I was not an automatic or immediate tither. It felt crazy to me to, to make that kind of jump. But over a few years, I grew my trust in God and worked my way up to a tie. Sometimes it's, I've seen it called like the generosity ladder, kind of one rung at a time. And this will sound a little counterintuitive, but for, for some reason, I've found that when I give back to God our first 10%, I end up being a better manager or steward of the, remind, of the remaining 90% than I was of 100. You might think that tithing sounds as foolish as walking around a mighty walled city and expecting the walls to fall, fall down because of shouting. But when we are aligned with God and his purposes, when we live lives of contentment, it's possible. It's actually the natural result. One barrier for those who have never given like that is going from zero to 10%. It's a big leap. All right, I told you, it was too big for me to do all at once. So I grew steps at a time. But another barrier, though, is how we judge that first step. Because for me, it didn't feel like it was very much. Now, I mean, it felt a lot to me. But I knew there are people out there giving way more than I was. And so there was like this kind of voice or this kind of nag. Like, what difference could my little part make? And this is where walking through the generosity journey on page 22 of your, of your journal is helpful. The most important thing you can do today to grow in your life of generosity is to get on the path. Give something, right? Commit something. And then grow from there. Take the next step. As someone familiar with our church budget, I can tell you that we have several teams who do incredible, faithful work, and they operate on relatively tiny budgets. Trust me, your little bit, especially over a course of the year, can fund one or more team's ministry work. So do not minimize your gift. Even those of us who are on autopilot through automatic draft, uh, drafts from our bank accounts, it's true for us as well. There's still a, another step to take. All of us can grow and take that next step. And if everyone in our church, from first-time givers to lifelong givers and everyone in between, takes the next step on the generosity journey, just think of the financial impact that'll have on our ability 
to fulfill God's mission here for FPCA. I want to say that wherever you are on that journey, that you are valued. That's a, a key component to unity and alignment within a family, is, is knowing that you are a valued part of that. You matter to us, and we cannot fully do what God is calling us to do without you. And that kind of alignment is what can make Psalm 133 a reality here. John Buchanan wrote, Wouldn't it be something if we could show the world the transforming power of a gospel that turns ideological opponents into brothers and sisters who love one another, who can't stop enjoying, praying, caring for, protecting one another. If we did that, the world might even find us interesting again. I can tell you, unity is interesting, especially in these times. And unity within this congregation is the natural byproduct of being aligned in vision. Our, our operating budget is, the, is for the day-to-day -day mission and ministry of the church, this portion of the body of Christ. And every person here matters and every commitment matters. We are aligned in the word, the trinity, in heart, and in vision. In a moment, Colt and I are going to go sit down with our family, and I've got our card here, just like all of you. If you're online, you, you'll see a, a link to a digital card that you can submit online. And she is going to play some, some music. Um, we always say soft enough so that you and your spouse can, can talk if, if you need to, but not loud enough you can't hear each other. Uh, it also kind of gives you that cover. Okay, no one's going to hear what we're saying. No, one, no one's eavesdropping anyways. Don't worry if you need to have that conversation. But do that. And uh, after a brief period of time, uh, allow us to get up first. And we're, we'll come forward and we'll put our card here in the basket and after that, everyone who considers FPCA to be their church home, you're invited to bring your card forward as well. If, if walking up and down is, is tough, uh, just you know, fold it up, give it to your neighbor, and ask them to please drop it in there for you. I bet they will. And if we have guests or friends or family that are, that are here today, just know we don't expect you to turn in a card. I mean, we won't say no. But there's no reason for you to feel that pressure to do so. Don't worry about it. But we just we do ask for you to, to pray for all of us as we're prayerfully considering our commitment for 2025. So let us prepare ourselves to approach God, the great multiplier aligned in vision. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.